Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to make a short statement. In the world of royal servants, there are few more controversial figures than Paul Burrell. I think Paul is a fascinating character. As Diana's butler and footman to the Queen, he served the royal family for over 20 years. Only one man in history has ever served and been close to the Queen for 11 years and Princess Diana for 10. But Burrell was no ordinary staff member. He was a former insider who went on trial for theft from his employers and was cleared. Is this what you expected? Of course it is. Paul. But who now enjoys a lucrative life of celebrity. Honestly, Paul, isn't it about the money? It is not about the money. But how did the man handpicked by the Queen have such a meteoric rise to fame? How did he secure the trust of Princess Diana? And was he really privy to the royal's greatest secrets? With access to his family. He is very loyal. His supporters. Paul was a keeper of her secrets, there's no doubt about it. And his critics. They watch him, but they don't trust him. We tell the extraordinary story of Paul Burrell from servant to celebrity. Today, Paul Burrell is one of the most visible figures in royal commentary. His 10 years as butler to Princess Diana still generate endless fascination and secure numerous TV bookings, including popular daytime TV shows. Joining me now is Princess Diana's former butler, Paul Burrell, of course, one of the people who knew her best of all. Morning, Paul. Can Please. you believe it's been that long, Janet? I yeah. can't believe I can't that. believe it's that long. <laughs> <laughs> I think in Britain, we, we love a character. He's incredibly colourful. He's very emotive. And, of course, he offers insight that a lot of people can't necessarily give. Having served as butler to Princess Diana, Paul became a household name, with the public eager to hear every detail of his life as a royal servant. Princess Diana made Paul Burrell famous, but Paul Burrell kept himself in the public eye for many decades and years thereafter. Paul's celebrity status grew through several high-profile TV appearances. Today, he shares aspects of his domestic world with his Instagram followers. He lives in a mock Tudor mansion in Cheshire, from where he also sometimes films video messages, revealing more details of his life with the royals. I've been thinking about all those parties which I attended with the royal family through the years. Parties with the Queen, fancy dress balls at Balmoral, family parties with Princess Diana, and parties celebrating the life of the princess. But his 21st century life is in stark contrast to his upbringing in the Derbyshire mining town of Grassmoor, where he grew up with two younger brothers. The younger of them, Graham, has agreed to share details of their childhood. Well, we were three boys in a terraced house, two up, two down. Uh, Dad worked seven days a week, 12 hours a day. Mum was always there. We shared a bedroom together. We had bath time together on a Sunday night in Tim Bath. The young Paul found a form of escape from his surroundings in the glamorous world of Hollywood. I remember as a, as a child, there was, there was always a poster up on wall from his film magazine. He'd have a picture of Bette Davis or a picture of Elizabeth Taylor pinned to his bedroom wall as we were children. There was something about Paul that was always being led uh, to a different life. Age 12, Paul Burrell came face to face with a world entirely unlike his own on a family trip to London. We always went to Palace and we always went to see Busby's. And, and on this particular time, we were all holding railings, three little boys from Derbyshire. And Paul said to Mum and Dad, One day I'm going to work there. Dad ruffled his hair and said, Yeah, of course you are, son. After leaving school at 16, Paul studied for a diploma at Catering College. Upon graduating, he worked briefly in hotels on the south coast until a previous application to the royal household yielded a job offer. In 1976, at just 18, Paul Burrell began work as 14th footman to the Queen. This photo from his Instagram page shows him in Windsor Castle, but much of his time was spent at Buckingham Palace. When Paul did actually get the job at Buckingham Palace, it were Unreal, we were, we were stood looking at the most famous house in the land. It gave us a doorway into a world 
that was so, so far from, from where we lived. It were a world of fantasy. It was like living a, a, a fairy tale in many ways for him. I think he had to pinch himself from time to time. We used to drive down, go into Buckingham Palace, sit in his bedroom window looking down the mall, and that was so exciting. Within 16 months of starting at the palace, he was promoted to personal footman to the Queen. And she'd apparently said, who is that young man? And she'd been told, and, he, and she said, well, he seems to be uh, very good at what he does. Let's try him out. And I think she was looking for a new footman. So, I mean, she doesn't have very many, and she doesn't have very many men in that close area. But, you know, the, Paul Burrell, um, in a very short time, became one of the key um, male servants in the Queen's life. Once promoted, the Queen tested Paul Burrell with a job very close to her heart. Burrell was thrown in at the deep end. The first thing she said to him was, oh, do you like dogs? And he, he said, I love dogs, Your Majesty. Well, let's see if they like you. But Paul was quite practical at breakfast that morning. He'd wrapped up a couple of sausages on the breakfast table and wrapped them up in a napkin and tucked them away in his pocket because he thought they might come in useful if he had to sort of placate the corgis. His secret weapon came in very handy because he managed to sort of rush off after the dogs behind some trees and sort of dish out their treats to them. And after that, of course, they, uh, they wouldn't leave him alone. It went until I actually stood in Royal Enclosure at Royal Ascot and seen the carriage drive swoop into the Royal Enclosure and saw Paul sat on back at carriage, directly behind Queen, that it, it, it hit me like a ton of bricks that my brother was so close to Her Majesty. As her personal footman and chief corgi walker, Paul Burrell was one of the Queen's top servants. The images he posts online illustrate the pride he took in his job. But like all staff members, Paul would have been made very aware of his standing. Di Davis, who served the royals from 1994 to 98 as head of Scotland Yard Royalty Protection Force, remembers well the boundary between the royals and their staff. I think Her Majesty, she has seen so many servants, police officers, private secretaries come and go. All of us who work with and for the royal family have to remember our place. We're there to support them, but not there to be our, their best friends. Whilst Paul may have been kept busy with his duties for the Queen, he still found time to help out the newest addition to the royal family. In 1981, Diana Spencer was living at Buckingham Palace in the months leading up to her wedding to Prince Charles. And this other member of staff called Mark Simpson had got close to the princess and he was taking her Big Macs. And so he pulled Paul Burrell in to be part of this uh, mission. And so they went to a local McDonald's and they brought back Big Macs and fries. And they apparently sat and had it together. And that's Diana. I think she could mix with everybody. But whilst Paul was becoming popular upstairs, it would be downstairs that romance blossomed. Paul met his wife, Maria, uh, who was a maid to Prince Philip while they were making uh, the Queen's bed. He and Maria did uh, break new ground because normally what happens when below stairs staff marry was that one of them, at least, has to stop working. Paul happened to mention this to the Queen one day, and the Queen said, well, that, that can't be right. Um, you and Maria deserve to stay on. Although today, Paul is strongly associated with Lady Diana, it was originally his wife Maria who bonded with the princess and secured Paul's future with the newest royal. Sometimes she would pop down to their little tiny muse flat, which is at the back of Buckingham Palace, where all the servants lived, and she would, you know, drop in to see, see Maria as well. So slowly, this sort of relationship was building. So Princess Diana and Maria were, it could be argued, as thick as thieves in the early years. They were both new mums, um, so sharing their experiences and bonding over that new life. By the mid 80s, when Diana and Charles needed more staff at Highgrove, their Gloucestershire residence, Diana made an offer to Maria, not Paul. Diana begins sort of appealing to, uh, to Maria to think about the future and you can't carry on living in this pokey little flat. Why don't you come 
and work for us. And with pressure from Diana and a lot more pressure from Maria about a new life in the countryside, um, they managed to uh, persuade Paul about the benefits of family life at Highgrove. Although initially reluctant to leave the Queen's service, in 1987, Paul relented to pressure from Diana and his wife by moving to Highgrove to become butler to the Prince and Princess of Wales. And I don't blame him in one sense, you know, uh, they were the future as it were, or she was the future, and the potential future Queen. Why wouldn't uh, an ambitious servant want to be on the right side as it were? But as Paul began on the exciting new chapter in his life, words of warning echoed in his ears. Just before he left, he was taken aside by a very senior um, figure at Buckingham Palace who said to him, Paul, there is something you need to know about the Charles and Diana household. All is not as it seems. In 1987, Paul Burrell found himself working for possibly the most high-profile royal couple in living memory, the Prince and Princess of Wales. Based at Highgrove, he was a highly valued butler, but relations between Charles and Diana were strained. All the staff in the royal household knew that Prince Charles was carrying on a years-long affair with Camilla Parker Bowles, Princess Diana is first absolutely suffering and devastated and then very slowly begins to try to find love and friendship in other places. With a growing divide between Charles and Diana, the princess drew on close friends for comfort. The photos Paul shares on social media from this time reflect the increasingly personal relationship he was developing with her. Many times when we visited, there'd be a knock at door He'd open the door and the princess would be stood there. I watched the friendship grow. She was calm around Paul. They were good together. Paul knew what she wanted before she wanted it. Paul soon found himself in a more trusted relationship with his employer than he had ever had working for the Queen at Buckingham Palace. She didn't have a husband who could talk to her. So she would talk to Paul. When she started to call him her emotional washing machine, she would dump all her innermost thoughts and emotions on him. They would spin it around together on a fast cycle and she would always walk away feeling lighter and cleaner. Before long, Diana was asking Paul to enable her own extramarital relationships, in particular with former army captain James Hewitt, who had been Diana's horse riding instructor. There was one time when Diana asked him to go and pick up James Hewitt to take him to Highgrove even, which is quite astonishing. So. Burrell put him in the back of a car underneath a, a blanket. And um, I mean, whether it really worked, it's highly unlikely because there are police all over the estate at, at Highgrove. The marriage problems of Charles and Diana soon became public when the Prime Minister made an unprecedented announcement. It is announced from Buckingham Palace that with regret, the Prince and Princess of Wales have decided to separate. As Diana and Charles discussed separation practicalities, the princess made an astonishing demand. Charles said, well, you know, whatever you want, just take it and go. And uh, she said, well, what I want is, um, I want Paul. From 1992, Paul Burrell became butler solely to Diana, based out of Kensington Palace. It's interesting to speculate on how that felt for Paul Burrell. Did he feel that he was stepping away from the real heart of the royal family, so away from the Queen, away from Prince Charles, away from the blood heirs of the English monarchy. Or did he feel the opposite, that actually Princess Diana was clearly the superstar, obviously far and away much more charismatic and interesting than any of the other royals? Diana ran her household much more informally than any other royal. The normal hierarchy of servants was ignored, and whoever was closest to Diana personally would rise to the top. She was falling out with people, staff were coming and going. The only sort of constant in it all, at least to me on the outside looking in, seemed to be Paul Burrell. Before long, 
both Diana's private secretary and her other butler, Harold Brown, left her service. Candid photos from Paul's Instagram feed reveal how Diana even started to become a feature of Paul's social life. In 1994, she attended his wife Maria's 40th fancy dress birthday party. But as their lives became ever more entwined, Diana started to rely on Paul more and more. She started leaving notes about her life, her thoughts, asking him for advice on all, on all manner of things. Paul has given the public glimpses of these notes through social media. He was definitely now being pulled into um, things that a butler wouldn't ordinarily see unless invited. In recent years, Paul has been publicly questioned over whether the relationship with Diana was more like that between friends than employer and employee. The thing was, of course, she shouldn't have let me come that close. Because there's a line, and I knew where the line was. That's what I'm interested in. Yes. Do you know where the line is? Because I think yes. that exactly your do. terminology is interesting that you know the line. Did he allow himself to cross that boundary? Yes, I suspect he probably did. I understand that if he had turned down the sort of extracurricular stuff that he was now doing for her, well, where would that leave him? He, he worked in Kensington Palace. He saw the, the revolving door of staff being turfed out who sort of fell out of favor. She needed someone else by her side. She needed someone to look after her and to give her attention. And she approached the world through her feelings. So if she didn't feel loved or cared for in the moment, she would possibly feel very, very insecure and sad. But I just have a little sense that what bonded them was Diana's need to be loved and Paul's need to be loved. In 1996, the Prince and Princess of Wales divorced, meaning Diana was officially no longer a member of the royal family. With Diana now free to use her international profile however she chose, Paul Burrell's role once again stepped up to a new level. On now iconic tours to Angola and Bosnia in aid of landmine charities, Paul travelled with her in a role that transcended his title of butler. He was wearing many hats. He was PR, he was chauffeur, he was private secretary, he was butler. He was everything rolled into one, which I think speaks to how much she relied on him and how much she trusted him. I remember that tour to Angola in particular. You know, we were all there for the famous shot of the princess walking through the minefield. And, and you know, and, and there's Burrell in a Ralph Lauren shirt, same as the princess. And you're thinking, this guy now really is very important in her life. 1997 was not only the peak of Diana's public profile, it was also the pinnacle of Burrell's career as a servant. The press described him as the most important person in her life. Gushing newspaper profiles, I should know. I wrote some of them about who was this remarkable man, you know, Boyfriends may come and go, but one man's constant step forward, Paul Burrell, and I think he rather enjoyed it. Paul soon became known as Diana's Rock. I mean, a lot of people have said to me, well, he wasn't the only person she referred to as her rock. There are a number of other people. Well, well that may be the case, but what I can say is that it didn't, it didn't come from Burrell. I didn't hear it first uh, from Burrell. It, probably came from Diana. Paul has subsequently claimed in TV appearances he was not only her rock, but also Diana's best friend. I was her best friend. I was a great advisor on what to wear and when to wear it. I did great flower arrangements. I think the friendship were, were greater than they thought at the time, if that makes sense. I think it were great when you look back at it, when you're actually traveling through it. I don't think he was her best friend. Uh, I, I think that's a, a misunderstanding. I think he f that's something that he subsequently came to in the years after her death. But Paul was a keeper of her secrets, there's no doubt about it. He may have been the keeper of her secrets, but since her death, he has revealed them too. One of the most sensational was a letter she wrote just 10 months before the tragic accident that took her life. In 2003, Paul revealed the existence of a letter that Diana had written a couple of months after her divorce from Charles, saying that she thought Charles wanted to kill her. This letter was given to Paul, um, he says, as insurance, and it was in Diana's hand. But Diana was paranoid about these things. I mean, Burrell, I think, did his best to, to reassure her. 
the fact that she confided in him about it, I, I wasn't entirely surprised. I mean, she told me some of this stuff too. She got Burrell to pull up all the carpets on one occasion and even lift floorboards to see if they could find um, bugs, but they never found anything at all, of course. Only months after Diana wrote this letter to Paul on August 31st, 1997, he received news that brought his life as a royal servant to an unexpected and gruesome end. I was actually with Paul uh, at Kensington Palace. We was woke in the early hours of the morning with police knocking at the door. I remember seeing policemen in Paul's hallway. Paul on telephone. Comes off telephone, said the princess had been injured. They were like a rabbit in headlights. Everything, his job, his best friend, everything were in jeopardy. The driver and Dodi al Fayed died at once. The security man and Diana initially both survived, though ambulance men spent two hours with her at the scene. They were brought here to the PTA Salpetriere Hospital, but such was the gravity of Diana's injuries, they pronounced her dead at 4 a.m. Paris time. Upon hearing of Princess Diana's death in Paris, Paul left to perform one final royal duty. He arrived before Charles or any other royal and began arranging for her to be brought back to Britain. They just wanted to take care of all the loose ends and make sure everything was in order and protect the dignity. After her televised funeral in Westminster Abbey, Paul was one of only two non-family members invited to Diana's private burial at the family estate, Althorpe. But perhaps the greatest honor for Paul in the months after Diana's death was his involvement in her memorial fund. He would explain in TV interviews how this was a way of protecting her memory. For me, it's, it's a way of carrying forward um, what I began 10 years ago, looking after the princess in a private way. I can now look after the princess in a public way. While being employed by the Memorial Fund to arrange charitable work, Paul Burrell appeared at events as Diana's representative. The press got more interested in Paul after Princess's death because he was more out there, more visible. They were intrigued. And instead of standing there with a tray serving champagne, someone is standing in front of you with a tray serving you champagne. By the middle of 1998, Paul Burrell had carved out a place for himself in public life as the spokesperson for Princess Diana's work and ideals. But with his public profile rising, what was more important to Princess Diana's former butler?
Princess Diana's death, Paul Burrell, her former butler, was working as the chief fundraiser of her memorial fund. The Princess of Wales Memorial Committee gathered in 11 Downing Street for their fifth meeting. But it wasn't long before his high profile began ruffling feathers. It is a moving and natural progression for Paul Burrell to be the person to take up the mantle, to carry forth championing the causes embraced by the princess in her lifetime. I think as Paul Burrell's stock rose and his profile increased and he found himself in the middle of the media spotlight as the person closest to Diana, I think that led to a perception that he was enjoying it all a little bit too much, uh, that he's a butler who's getting ideas above his station. And looking out across this room tonight, I feel that her spirit is still alive. There he was at the Memorial Fund Ball. He had spent 20 odd years in the shadows, as invisible as servants are meant to be. And he's thrust into the spotlight. It did seem extraordinary. He found it all um, almost too good to be true. And it seemed it was. In December 1998, Paul was made redundant. Mr. Burrell only had a few words to say. Paul claimed Diana's sister, Lady Sarah McCorkadale, broke the news to him in a London wine bar. To her family, he would always remain a servant, and he was working class. They were aristocracy. And, of course, he was increasingly speaking on her behalf. And I think there was a feeling from her family that that was a bit inappropriate. It's human nature to want to better yourself. And I don't feel that that in itself is something we can criticise him for. But the fact that other people around him were disgruntled by it suggests that there was something else going on. So, and the something else could have been that other people wanted Paul to maintain his position as a staff member, or that other people noticed a grandiosity in Paul and they were fearful about where it might go. I think Paul was uh, devastated. He thought he had done good work for the charities in Princess Diana's name. His departure from the fund once again made Paul front page news. Paul Burrell, who joined the Prince and Princess of Wales' staff in 1988, drove off to spend Christmas with his family in Cheshire. Paul returned to Cheshire to begin a new life away from the spotlight. I think he felt he owed it to Maria and his sons to turn his back on his celebrity times. Maria wanted some stability. She wanted to be near her family. He did actually try and start a new kind of a life. I think it is too simplistic to say that Paul loved the celebrity. I think he genuinely believed that he was Princess Diana's standard carrier. He was her knight in shining armor, that, that he it was his role to protect her, promote her, because she wasn't here anymore to, to do so. And so him kind of disappearing into obscurity, I don't think would ever have suited him. The Burrell's peaceful suburban life didn't last long. In January 2001, there was a dawn raid on their home by the Metropolitan Police. When the serious crime squad searched Mr. Burrell's home in Farnd and Cheshire, they took away a number of items. Police found hundreds of items that once belonged to the princess. Reports of designer bags, personal letters, and more than 2,000 photos and negatives. The police were just amazed how much property he had. Some intimate uh, letters from Diana to William, her old school reports. And I think, not unnaturally for the police, they felt, well, why would a butler uh, have this? It was a, a huge story. But for Paul Burrell, his entire life was turned upside down, and the police built a case was based on a, on a set of assumptions. A set of assumptions were, broadly, that um, Burrell had, had, had hidden this stuff away, stolen it um, in those weeks and months after Diana's death. As the executors of Diana's estate, the Spencer family made the final decision to pursue the prosecution. Paul was charged with three counts of theft relating to over 300 items. Once it was clear that the Spencers wanted the trial to go ahead come what may, I think Prince Charles's household had to be seen to be working in tandem with the executors and therefore lent their support 
to the trial. Almost two years after the Burrell's house was raided, the trial began at the Old Bailey. Today, he's here at the Old Bailey, charged with stealing from her estate. Paul's defense claimed he was keeping Diana's belongings for safekeeping, an explanation the prosecution disputed. I mean, it was going to be the trial of the decade, and here was a member of Princess Diana's innermost circle charged with stealing her effects. I talked to him many times. He was suicidal at times. He was in a very dangerous place. His view was that when the boys were older, they would want to have this stuff, and he would be, they would be grateful to him that he had preserved it. Now, this was a slightly naive view, but it was a view. It was horrendous. It was like a free-for-all. We all went down as a family, show support. Uh, and listening, listening to how the court case was being presented, and during that time, he, he lost all the skin off his hands and off his feet. And that was down to worry. Two weeks into the trial, and there was a shocking development. Just before Paul was due to take the stand, the Queen made an unprecedented intervention. She claimed to recall a conversation with Paul, during which he had told her he was taking some of Diana's belongings for safekeeping. I knew the princess, and I knew that she was in the habit of giving many of her things away, and no one benefited more than that uh, than Paul Burrell. The case collapsed. He's happy and relieved to have been acquitted on all charges after the terrible ordeal of the last 21 months. I think, at the end of the day, Paul Burrell would have uh, liked his right to reply in court um, to balance out the accusations and the reputation damage that had taken place over the previous two weeks. But ultimately, uh, the Queen stepped in. There was a celebratory lunch with his legal team in Covent Garden, pasta and champagne, to prepare for the journey home to Cheshire. Congratulations. How's it feel? Congratulations. I'm very happy, thank you. Where's the taxi? After the trial, Paul Burrell once again returned to his home in Cheshire. But this time, it seemed he wasn't ready to settle for a quiet life. Wait and see what people offer me and um, go forward in a, in a positive way. Notoriety isn't a bad thing in tabloid Britain. These are things that the public really likes. So he was canny enough to know that he may get a few juicy offers, which he did. The Daily Mirror's boasting that it will shed light on the trial with Paul Burrell's exclusive account of the last 22 months. He sold his story to the, the Mirror and again, no doubt, thought, well, I've been put through the mill on this issue. What benefits can I bring to my family, to my future career? The establishment have tried to destroy me. What can I do to enhance my situation? Paul's next move saw him thrust into the spotlight once more. He wrote a book, A Royal Duty, claiming to set the story straight. To understand the motivation as to why Paul wrote A Royal Duty, you first have to understand and see what happened to him. He had been put on trial, accused of the ultimate betrayal of thieving from Princess Diana. He had become a pariah in many respects, and it's fair to say that they went to the brink of ruin. I think the intention, uh, from what I understand, was always to, to give his side of the story. He felt that um, the public thought he was a, a common thief, um, and he had to explain what he did and why he did it. In the weeks leading up to the book's publication, it was serialized in the Daily Mirror. Piers Morgan, the editor at the time. He'll never betray Diana. He'll never betray the Queen. He's made it very clear. The week before the book was due to be published, there was an unprecedented statement from Princess William and Harry. William tonight finally decided enough was enough. Their press secretary read it out. We cannot believe that Paul, who was entrusted with so much, could abuse his position in such a cold and overt betrayal. It is not only deeply painful for the two of us, but also for everyone else affected. And it would mortify our mother if she were alive today. And if we might say so, we feel we are more able to speak for our mother than Paul. We ask Paul, please, to bring these revelations to an end. William and Harry speaking out about the book 
added fuel to the fire and generated more interest because of course people then thought gosh what's in it what's so bad that William and Harry are so upset Paul responded with his own statement I am saddened at the statement issued on behalf of Prince William and Prince Harry saddened because I know that this book is nothing more than a tribute to their mother I remember drafting a statement I remember calling all the uh, producers and news crews to get the 10 o'clock news slot because we weren't going to allow uh, Buckingham Palace to try and control the narrative that evening by calling the book a cold and over betrayal. I am convinced that when the princes and everyone else reads this book in its entirety, they will think differently. So we took charge and Paul delivered a statement. I would also like to point out that following the collapse of my trial at the Old Bailey last year, no one from the royal family contacted me or said sorry for the unnecessary ordeal myself, my wife, and my sons were put through. Embarking on a world tour to promote the book, Paul was soon confronted with accusations of cashing in. I had to stand up for myself and what I think is true, and I've done that, and that's why I've written the book. Honestly, Paul, isn't it about the money? It is not about the money, absolutely not. I think that's a little disingenuous when he says it's not about the money. But then, of course, publicly, he can never admit that it's about the money, can he? I mean, how can anyone ever admit that it's about the money? I'll, I'll just say this, that in the years after Diana died, uh, he was offered many different times uh, the chance to write his book. Uh, one offer, which I saw, was for four million dollars. Uh, he refused it flat and didn't entertain any discussions. And News International offered him a package totaling two million pounds. He refused that deal. Uh, he chose the lesser deal on the table, which was £350,000 from the Daily Mirror. It was about, for Paul, the truth. How could his story be presented as he wanted it to be presented? You know, there's that such inherent hypocrisy in all of us. We love to say, oh goodness, you know, roll our eyes at someone who we say is cashing in on you know, having worked for the royals, but we, but equally, we can't get enough of it. We want to lap up everything that they have to say. With the spotlight firmly on the former butler, in 2004, Paul appeared on ITV's popular reality show, I'm a Celebrity, Get Me Out of Here. Taking part in a number of challenges, much to the amusement of presenters, Ant and Deck. I can't feel anything at the minute. Put my... And I watched some of it, and he was very funny. You know, he was screaming and shouting, as people do. Paul finished the show in second place. And I think he was surprised at how well he did. It was a real kind of role reversal. He'd been kind of public enemy number one, and now suddenly he was the nation's sweetheart. With his popularity on the rise, Paul decided to move his family to America where he accepted offers to endorse a range of products, from teacups to linen. I do understand why if you've been in a trial in England and it was very exposing, you get to America where people are going to treat you much better and they're going to treat you like you're famous, without any baggage at all, with a nice little paycheck ticking over. It's seductive. The Americans love British royalty and they love the kind of Downton Abbey, upstairs, downstairs kind of story. So here was a bona fide servant to the British royal family, best mate of Diana's, and was prepared to talk about it. So the Americans lapped him up. Paul's popularity wasn't to last. After the inquest into Diana's death, he was secretly filmed, admitting he didn't tell the whole truth in court. Paul's world once again came crashing down.
More than 10 years on from Diana's death, and with numerous conspiracy theories into what caused her fatal crash, an inquest finally began. Paul Burrell, still living in America at the time, was called as a witness. All day, Mohammed Al-Fayed sat in court listening as Paul Burrell rejected any suggestion that Diana was about to announce her engagement to his son, Dodi. I find that difficult to believe, he said. This was only a 30-day relationship. She was on the rebound from Mr. Khan. He gave evidence as somebody who knew her intimately as a servant, but also a confidence. He was one of the last six people that actually she phoned before she died. He has always seen it as part of his job to protect her, and being part of the inquest was part of that. The world's media were on tenderhooks, desperate to see if Paul had anything new to say. But instead of new revelations, Paul Burrell quashed rumours that were circulating about Diana, including that she was pregnant with Dodi Fayyad's baby. The princess, he said, was on the pill and definitely not pregnant, and he suggested she may have allowed herself to be seen so publicly with Dodi in order to make Mr Khan jealous. The inquest took months to complete, yet appeared to confirm what many already suspected. Let's be clear about this. Princess Diana died because a drunk driver was driving her car and was going far too fast in a Paris underground tunnel. And crucially, she wasn't wearing a seatbelt, neither was Dodie. So those are the very base facts, but I think there was such an emotional outpouring of her untimely death that the facts got lost. With the inquest finished, it wasn't long before Paul Burrell found himself having to face uncomfortable questions again. When he was secretly filmed by a Sun journalist, admitting he didn't tell the whole truth in court. He was drunk, um, he was jet-lagged, and he maintains he was, it was, he was a victim of entrapment. Um, he might have, there might have been an element of showing off. I'm sure that's quite possible too. The total disregard for how this will feel to the people who were affected by Princess Diana's death, it just takes my breath away. Paul's lawyers issued a statement stating that Paul was showing a degree of exaggeration, but he was in private, not in court, not under oath. He did not conceal anything remotely relevant to the inquiry. Despite this, the impact was wide-reaching. The fairy tale was over. The fantasy was broken. He wasn't this twinkly-eyed English butler. I think he did become less credible as a kind of talking head and as a source on the royal family. His star was waning, and he returned to Britain, to the family's flower shop. Paul's wife and children remained in America. It, it certainly had a, a negative effect on views about him. You know, he, he went from being this rather sort of lovable figure 
on 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 daytime television to to someone who you know the public sort of collectively groaned about in 2017 after years of media speculation over his sexuality paul revealed he was gay and planning to marry his partner of 10 years graham cooper with paul's private life almost as valuable as princess diana's the sun newspaper ran the exclusive paul wanted uh, a private wedding and he wanted to come out um, as a proud gay man privately to the people who know and loved him. Um, we've got to remember, the Sun newspaper chose to out him. So the moment that news breaks, you are immediately out of control of the story. So Paul did a deal to take control of the narrative. Paul was once again welcomed onto British daytime television. In an interview on This Morning, he revealed how he told his family about his sexuality. To sit with them and talk about my sexuality and to, to cry with them and say, this is your dad. Mm. I'm your dad. I'm not going to change. I'll always be here for you. I said that to my wife. I said, I am your best friend. I'll always look after you. I'll always look out for you. As complex as Paul is, it's important to understand and not villainize him every turn, to understand that he also had some very difficult challenges. Uh, which he had to find ways to overcome. Since his marriage, Paul has sold his flower shop, but still accepts offers to comment on big royal stories, including talking to the Loose Women panel about Harry and Meghan's departure from the UK. They're not the first royals that have decided to leave the country or to have another home in another country. Diana was also deciding to spend some of her time in America. And in fact, the day she died on her desk, were plans of a home in Malibu, in California, which she was in the process of purchasing. Undoubtedly, Paul will want to talk about one of the biggest royal stories this summer, the unveiling of a statue of Princess Diana on what would have been her 60th birthday. When it comes to the unveiling of the statue, I think Paul is realistic about his chances of being in attendance, but I'll say this. Um, I do hope that Princes William and Harry recognize the place that Paul Burrell had in their mother's life. The fact that he may have even more knowledge and secrets to tell about Princess Diana and indeed the royal family, this has allowed his image to carry on, if you like, and the press and the public to be intrigued by this unique man and his unique relationship with Diana and indeed the royals themselves. He isn't going to deny his background and his past. And when television companies ask him to comment, um, if he wants to, he'll do it. And he'll continue to do that. And um, he would consider that no more than, than, than a right, really, if you like. Paul Burrell holds a really unique place in public life. He's a public figure who's now a celebrity in his own right. But I think he's slightly mistrusted by the British public. And at the same time, they can't get enough of him.